so today I'm going to talk about generation of antibody diversity and the set of slides that I've posted about this um, are for both today and for Friday. Um, so I'm not going to like repost another set of slides for Friday. Um, I'm just going to use the, the rest of these. Um, and um, I want to remind you of a few things that we've already talked about in terms of setting up the problem that we are then going to be solving for the rest of today and on Friday. Um, so I set you up with this one uh, problem last time, um, which was this issue that um, if we think about the specificity of antibodies, it is estimated that we can make about 10 to the 16th different antibodies. Um, and um, this is a bit of a problem compared to the number of genes in the genome, um, which is only sort of on the order of 20,000. Um, when scientists were trying to figure out the answer for this, um, there were a couple of other observations that they were sort of taking into account when they were trying to figure out how this worked. And so I just want to remind you of some of those observations. Um, I used the complicated term on this slide. You don't have to actually care what allelic exclusion means yet. We'll, we'll actually see the definition of allelic exclusion next week. Um, but this is officially um, something that's known as allelic exclusion, um, which is that if you remember when we talked about those B cells um, that are making antibodies, we talked about the fact that each B cell makes homogeneous receptors. So each B cell might make multiple receptors, but those receptors are going to be like identical. So um, for that 10 to the 16th different number of antibodies that we could make, that requires 10 to the 16th different B cells. That doesn't, you can't have one B cell that's making more than one kind of antibody. So that's one thing to um, just make sure that we are aware of. Um, we also have known for a very long time that our adaptive immune responses, which are shown here in dark blue, um, change over time. Um, so um, you can see that the first time through, perhaps we have an antibody response. We've got a little delay. We make this nice response. And then the second time that we are exposed to that same antigen, we're going to have a larger response and a faster response. And so somehow we have to be able to sort of retain the information that we've previously seen this microbe and do something better. And so there has to be some kind of long-term memory that is involved with all of this. Um, this is involved with um, our B cell. And remember that our B cell is going to be able to make a B cell receptor and an antibody that are basically going to be identical, except for whether or not there's a transmembrane domain at the end. Um, so the B cell receptor and the antibody are basically the same. Um, so this is one of those observations that um, scientists had made before they figured out how this process worked. Um, they also knew that over time, antibodies could change, um, particularly the antibodies made during a response to a specific epitope could change. And so we can see changes in the affinity um, or the binding strength of our antibody for antigen. The antibody can get more specific. And we can also see changes in isotype. So we can see class switch. Um, and um, they, we sort of had this also this idea of clonal expansion 
um, and the clonal selection theory, where the idea is that we might make those 10 to the 16th different B cells, each of which makes its own unique antibody. So we have 10 to the 16th different B cells. Here it's shown as 2, because that's easier to draw than 10 to the 16th. Here it's 3, because 3 is also easier to draw than 10 to the 16th. Um, but they're meant to be showing you get some of those 10 to the 16th different B cells making 10 to the 16 different antibodies. You can notice you make one of them. Um, and then that one, if it ever sees its antigen, will um, proliferate, will make many, many copies of itself and sort of make a clone army. Um, so now you have a lot of those specific cells that can deal with the microbe. Um, and so all of these observations were out there when people were trying to figure out how to deal with this diversity problem. And some of them, as I go through some of the answers, you'll be like, oh, I see how that fits and works with some of these observations. Like, I see where they got, how they got that. Um, but what I want to point out is that Specifically, when we think about things like the clonal expansion piece of this, and when we think about, say, the primary and secondary response and the memory kind of part of this, um, one of the things that became pretty evident right away was there had to be some sort of change or something going on that could be transmitted from generation of cells to generation of cells. Not necessarily from like generation of human to generation of human, but from generation of cells to generation of cells. Like this cell had to be able to have some kind of change to make a particular receptor that it could then also make sure its progeny had. And that had to be, you know, something that could happen over a long period of time if we were actually going to have memory over a long period of time. And so if we think about things that can um, go across generations of cells, what does that make us start realizing or thinking about the fact that we're going to have to Imagine, what can one cell give to its progeny cells? What's one cell definitely going to give to its progeny cells? Hmm? The genes, specifically the DNA. And so um, some early scientists, I used to actually go through some of the really, there were some actually like alternate hypotheses, and I used to go through them all and make fun of the people who um, came up with them. Every one of them who I would make fun of actually won a Nobel Prize for something else, so like, not like we should feel bad for them when I make fun of them. But um, so there are all of these alternate ideas about how this could work. And one of the big things that people realized was we've got to involve the DNA because the DNA is the thing that's actually going to allow whatever this receptor thing is to be transmitted to progeny cells. And so if it was just a protein change, for example, that wouldn't be something you could easily transmit to progeny cells. And that wouldn't be something you could easily have for memory, because if the cell died, you'd be out of luck. Whereas here, if you have changes to genes, changes to the DNA, then we're going to be able to actually transfer that between generations of cells. Um, so... In general, we've got a couple of different ways that we solve this problem. This slide has a bunch of the technical terms for how we solve this problem. When you are going back to study for the exam, this will be a helpful little outline of the answers to how we solve the diversity problem. I haven't told you what all these words mean yet. So if you look at this slide and are like, I don't know what any of this means, that's okay, because I haven't told you yet. But this is a little bit of an outline of what we're going to see. And so if we're actually thinking about this antibody diversity problem, we think about we've got you know 10 to the 16th different antibody proteins, and our genome only has um, 
about 20,000 genes, we've got two different sort of themes or ways of, of solving this. One is something known as combinatorial diversity, which I'm going to spend most of the time today talking about. Um, and there's also something called junctional diversity. Um, and for both combinatorial diversity and junctional diversity, there are two examples. Um, and so we will see what all of these things mean um, going forward. And so the first thing that I want to um, explain is combinatorial diversity and have us start thinking about combinatorial diversity. It turns out you kind of already know some stuff about combinatorial diversity. You just don't know it as such. But in order to make combinatorial diversity make some sense, um, I'm actually going to tell you a side story, so diversion time. Um, so what we can imagine in our little diversion is that I decided that I was tired of this whole science thing and decided I was going to have another job. And so and my other job was I was going to have a restaurant. But the problem with me having a restaurant is I don't know how to cook very many things. And so my restaurant probably is going to have a very limited menu. Um, and so we can imagine, um, the, the fun joke about all of this is the not being able to cook part is not actually that much of an overstatement um, it, when I'm putting together this restaurant and this example. But let's imagine that I know how to cook beef and I know how to cook broccoli, even if I might struggle to spell broccoli. Okay, so I know how to cook two dishes. And if you look at my menu, you're going to find one thing on my menu, beef and broccoli, right? Now let's imagine I also learn how to cook chicken. Now I know how to cook three things, chicken, beef, and broccoli. I only got two things on my menu, beef and broccoli, chicken and broccoli, right? Because we're thinking about my menu as a combination of a protein and of a vegetable. But let's imagine I now really spend some time learning how to cook. And let's imagine that I also learned how to cook these things. So now I have five proteins. I can cook beef, chicken, pork, turkey, tofu. And we'll imagine I also learned how to cook carrots, spinach, corn, and tomatoes. I only know 10 recipes, okay? It's not like I'm not fancy. I got 10 recipes is all. But if we start counting these not as 10 individual recipes, but as combinations of things, then my menu actually has 25 things on it. So I got 10 recipes, but because I count, I'm gonna count them as combos of dishes, I'm gonna have 25 dishes. Because, I'm, because my menu is going to have beef and broccoli, beef and carrots, beef and spinach, beef and corn, beef and tomatoes, chicken and broccoli, chicken and carrots, chicken and spinach, chicken and corn, chicken and tomatoes, pork and broccoli, pork and carrots, and all the way through. And so I've only got 10, 10 dishes, but now I get way more than 10 things on my menu. And you can see that if I start to add a re even a relatively small number of more recipes, but we don't count just the individual recipes as what I got, but combos. Um, I can get a really big list of dishes on my restaurant menu from a really small number of recipes. Does that make sense? That's combinatorial diversity. Um, and we've got two different ways that combinatorial diversity is something that we can see in antibodies. So one part of this is just like my menu that you see here. We actually have, instead of having a beef and broccoli gene and a beef and carrots gene and a beef and spinach gene, instead of needing to have a whole gene for that, we actually use combinations of genes. 
And so each antibody is a combination of a heavy chain and a light chain. And so if we have five heavy chains, just like I have five proteins, and I have five light chains, just like I have five vegetables, that's only 10 genes, and yet I can make 25 antibody proteins. And so I'm using a small number of genes to get me a bigger number of proteins because I'm actually combining two different genes. In this case, the heavy chain and the light chain genes. And by combining those together, that lets me get to a bigger number of individual proteins from a smaller number of genes. So one way that we start to solve this problem is by combining heavy chains and light chains. So if you remember when I told you about the antibody structure, I told you how important it was that it's not just the heavy chain that binds to the antigen or just the light chain. It's the combination of the two. And that's sort of one of the ways that we're getting um, additional, um, additional diversity here. One of the other things that people sort of noticed um, is some of this information I had mentioned to you before about, well, the B cell can sometimes have a transmembrane domain on this receptor and sometimes not. Um, and we can even like class switch from IgM to IgG. So people said, well, what if it's not just a combination of a heavy chain gene and a light chain gene, but what if those genes had individual parts? And so we were actually making combinations within that. And so this is like if there, I don't know how I would make like a combination within the beef. I'm just really not that good at cooking. Um, but the idea is, well, what if we, it wasn't just heavy chain was one gene, but what if heavy chain was littler genes combined? And so you could get a lot of heavy chains by doing combos again of the littler genes. And one thing people realize right away, they're like, wait, this could work if the variable region and the constant region were encoded by different genes. Because then you could put a different variable region with different constant regions. So if you had, say, a variable region, you could put it with the mu constant region and make an IgM version of that antibody. Or you could put it with a, a gamma constant region and make it an IgG. So maybe if the heavy chain gene isn't really one gene, but it has these little parts to it, maybe we could explain pretty easily how we just sub out the part with a transmembrane domain or not, or with different constant regions or not. Um, and so we can sort of think about the variable region and the constant region as kind of being separate areas genetically. Um, and so this whole thing sort of eventually led to this idea of the mini gene hypothesis. And so what people realized was that in sort of this large section of the chromosome, there might be a region that encodes the constant region. So this you can see, see the C for constant region. And there might be some small gene segments that we can put together in different combos to make the variable region. So if we want to make a, bi a billion variable regions, we can have a small number of these two segments and then just put them together in different combos, just like I was doing with my meals. And so we're going to do this and make combos so we can use a small number of genes to make a lot of heavy chains. And then we're also going to have mini genes that come together to make light chains. And so in the end, we're going to have a list of a kind of small number of genes, but get a massive number of proteins. Um, and so the hypothesis basically was that there were these small mini genes shown here as things like V and J, that are put together. You can see there's a whole bunch of choices in the DNA. Those genes are put together 
along with another gene segment that encodes the constant region. And that is how that sort of combination of these different mini genes would be how we can get to um, genetic information encoding so many different proteins is by shuffling together all of these mini genes. Um, and so you can see this from an older version of your textbook here. Um, so this is only showing it, it's only showing it with four mini genes. And if they, I wish they had used more than four mini genes because it makes it so much easier with more than four. Um, but you can see they've got two V's, V1, V2, two J's, J1, J2. And the idea is that during the development of the B cell, when the B cell is growing up, the B cell chooses a V and chooses a J and puts them together. And when I say chooses a G, B and chooses a J, it's not really active choice. It's actually a random process. Um, and when I say puts them together, I mean it actually cuts its DNA. It cuts its genomic DNA and pastes it back together so that those two gene segments are next to each other. And so you can see here that this B cell picked V1 and J1. This one picked V1 and J2. This one picked V2 and J1. This one picked V2 and J2. And so we got four different receptors out of this and four different genes. That's why I wish they had used, you know, they'd use my example of 10. <laughs> they would get 25 different receptors by pairing together the different Vs and the different Js. Um, and you can also see that this hypothesis um, meant that, in fact, the um, DNA was cut in the B cell. So the B cell actually cuts this part of its DNA, throws out this intervening DNA as trash, and pastes together the V and the J that it has chosen. Um, one of the um, ways that scientists um, figured this out was that they looked at B cells that had undergone development. And they also looked at other cells in the body of the same organism. Um, and they often like to look at, they, they did different things with non-immune cells. But, so we'll just say a non-immune cell. They compared the DNA in a non-immune cell and the DNA in a B cell, and they saw the B cell's DNA had been changed relative to the non-immune cell. The B cell's DNA looked like this, where some V and some J had been pasted together, and some DNA had been thrown out, and every other cell in the body's DNA at this region looked like this, all separate. Um, so... Um, and each B cell had a different combo that it had made. Yeah, Jonah? We'll get there. <laughs> great, great question. We'll get there. Um, and um, there was a scientist who actually, one of the people who got the Nobel Prize for describing this process um, was a guy named Tonegawa. One of the predictions from this hypothesis um, was that you could find the trash DNA in B cells early in their development. And he found it. He found that developing B cells all have these little circles of DNA that they've thrown away um, because they have done this process. Um, and so we often refer to this process, and you'll see this later, as VDJ recombination. Um, I will tell you what the D stands for in a bit. Um, you can see that we've, we're talking about these segments like V and J. So that's where you can imagine that's where the V and the J come from in VDJ recombination. And the word recombination is, a cutting, is cutting and pasting DNA and making new DNA combinations. Um, and so these are all kind of examples of what that, how we're getting that combinatorial diversity in the way that we make B cell receptors or antibodies. So we're combining heavy chains and light chains. We're actually combining variable region genes with constant region 
and in order to make the variable region, we're actually combining um, different mini genes together. So you can see we sort of got, we're doing combinations on multiple levels in order to get us big numbers of receptors from a small number of genes. Yes? Is that we'll get there. <laughs> That's coming too. All of this are, these are good predicting questions. Um, and so um, in order to do this process and to make these genes, we actually do VDJ recombination twice in every B cell, once to make a heavy chain and once to make a light chain. When we make the heavy chain, we combine three different gene segments in order to make the variable region. Those three different gene segments in the heavy chain are called V, D, and J. There's your D, Jonah. <laughs> um, and so you can see that we're looking at just making the variable region of the heavy chain here. We, we get to pick a V, we get to pick a D, we get to pick a J. Whichever V we pick is going to encode amino acids about 1 to 101. These are only approximate numbers of that antibody protein. Whichever D we pick is going to encode amino acids 102 to 106. Whichever J we pick is going to be approximately 107 to 123. And so you can see that we would put that V, D, and J together. We throw out the intervening DNA, and we have the constant region. Um, in the case of um, the light chain, we just have a V segment and a J segment. It's a different area of the chromosome. You can see that the um, V segment in the light chain encodes um, amino acids approximately 1 to 97, while J is encoding approximately 98 to 110. Um, I'm going to draw this out on the board as well. Um, and this is, we'll partially get to your question, David. Um, note that in the problem set, I'm going to ask you about some drawings uh, to draw some things. Um, I'm giving you most of the drawing right now, but there's one part that I'm leaving out to, right now that I'm going to add in on Friday because I don't want to complicate everything. But you're going to see kind of approximately what that drawing would look like or how I might draw this. Yep, Brooke. So the, light chain the light chain doesn't have a D segment, just a V and a D. Okay. Yes. Jonah. Is it the same, I guess, gene as both? Are no, there's a, two different chromosomes, okay. two different sites. Yep. This is for the variable region, yes. Um, other questions? Let me go to the next slide before I just do my drawing. Because this, uh, Jonah, your question was about chromosomes. So the heavy chain is on chromosome 14 in humans. Um, you can see we actually have two, two light chain regions because evolution. Um, one is on chromosome 2, one is on chromosome 22. Um, and so um, I might draw I was going to draw this I might imagine a heavy chain locus that has three V's, three D's, and three J's because I get a little lazy about drawing so if I did that I might say I have V1 V2, E3, I might have D1, I might have D2, I might have D3, I might have J1, I might have J2, I might have J3. And then as far as you're concerned, we can just sort of have the constant regions. In reality, there for a heavy chain, 
there are five different sections of constant regions. Those five constant regions are mu for IgM, delta for IgG, for IgG gamma, epsilon, alpha. MDs give everyone apples. <laughs> so it's that order. And so we basically have the genetic information for each of the constant regions at the end of this um, setup for the variable region. Um, as I mentioned, um, there's, um, if I was thinking about um, this drawing compared to what I asked you for in the problem set, there's one element that I have not drawn here that we will get to later on. If I were going to draw a light chain, I might have this, I might have two V's, I might have two J's, and then I would have my constant region. It could either be lambda or it could be kappa, depending on which chromosome we're on. Um, sometimes you also will see um, people will like do things like have an, an H here. <laughs> see how there's a little H right there, V, little H? That tells you it's a heavy chain if you got confused. Um, and sometimes there'll be like a K, a kappa that's telling you kappa light chain or lambda light chain. So sometimes um, we'll notice the, the little H's or things like that. So that hopefully answers your question, Jonah, about the chromosomes. So these are, in fact, different loci on different chromosomes. Um, and David, I hope that, that addresses your question, at least to the level we're going to <laughs> address it now about constant regions. Yep, Brenna. And then if it were different then for the heavy chain, there would be... Like that's the light chain. Yeah, so those are light chains, and we know they're light chains both because there's not a D, mm -hmm. and because the constant region that's there is either lambda or kappa instead of the um, heavy chain constant regions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. For for heavy chain, it's the five. Yeah. For 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 us, yeah, this is heavy chain. So remember, we talked about the five isotypes. Also remember, there technically were like multiple Gs and things. I'm not actually drawing. There's, there's really multiple Gs there, but I'm not drawing them. Uh, we're, I'm just drawing that. that that's complicated enough. <laughs> um, so those allow you to make the five different isotypes. So you can make whatever variable region, and then you can pair it with whatever constant region um, you might want to pair it with. Um, so I'm going to switch the order of um, a couple slides because I think this might make more sense. Um, so here you can actually basically, I'm just showing you again the same business, but with the heavy chain now. Um, and so now you can see this is what the heavy chain looked like originally in the DNA. We had some V's, we had some D's, we had some J's. We had some constant region stuff. Yes, here it's showing M as multiple exons. I don't care if you know how many exons it is. Just know there's M constant region stuff. You can see that the DNA is going to get changed. So we're going to make some changes in the DNA. We're then going to get an RNA transcript. And that RNA is then going to be spliced. And we're going to then get our protein. And so you can see the VD and J region which is in the red, green, and yellow, made up the variable region of that heavy chain. And all this constant region business made up the constant region. And so this is sort of the process that we're going to see. Um, we can also see this process happening um, in the light chain. So here you can see we've got the light chain DNA starts out with all of these gene segments as being separate. We combine V and J um, in the DNA. Then we um, have the RNA. We'll do some splicing, and then we'll make our light chain. You can see the variable region is made from the VJ segments, and the constant region is made from 
this constant radial segment. Um, so I want us, again, um, I'm going to think just about my heavy chain here that I've drawn you. Um, and again, if you took exactly what I showed you here on the problem set, there's one thing that's still missing that we're still not at yet. But I want to, point, to show you one other piece to this, which is that this is what the DNA looks like before the B cell starts doing development. When the B cell then starts doing development, it picks a B, picks a D, picks a J, and uses those, OK? So this is sort of like the before DNA. I can also draw you the after DNA. Let's imagine that this B cell used V2, D3, and J2. Those just happen to be the ones it picked, OK? If those happen to be the ones that the B cell picked, then this is what the after DNA would look like. I said V2, right? This is my after DNA. So what the first thing that you should notice is that my three gene segments that the B cell picked have actually been joined together and are next to each other. So we've got B2, D3, J2 all right next to each other, nothing in between them. All of the DNA in between, like, say, the part that had V3 and the part that had D1 and the part that had D2, it got deleted. We have removed that DNA. We threw it in the DNA trash can. Similarly, this area with uh, between D3 and J2 got thrown away in the DNA trash can. But the stuff on the outside, like J3, stayed there. So we only do those recombination and rearrangements in between the segments we've chosen. The outside DNA does, stays untouched. So this is sort of the after. Uh, again, with one set of elements not added. Um, so there is a good thing about all of this, and there is a tricky thing about, well, there are a few tricky things about all of this. Um, but the good thing I want to show you is if we think back to this slide. Here we can see a whole bunch of V's, a whole bunch of J's, right? And eventually we want to make an RNA with V and J. So let's imagine we're in a cell that's not an immune cell. It did not do this change to its DNA. It does not have this after DNA here, okay? So we're going to start here with V, and we're going to be RNA polymerase. So we're going to make an RNA transcript from this. OK, so here I am. I'm making my RNA transcript. I'm RNA polymerase. And I'm going to make this RNA. And then I'm going to make this RNA. And then I'm going to make this RNA. And what's going to happen now? <laughs> yes, I am doing this on purpose. <laughs> what's going to happen now? No. Why, why is it going to stop? It's not stopping. <laughs> it's just going to keep on going, right? Is there any point to this? How would you feel if you had to keep on going for 23 kilobases and you were RNA polymerase for, in a kind of pointless way? <laughs> huh? Mm, you might not cut it, but you might do something else. Oh, or skip it or whatever. 
fall off. Be like, I'm tired. I'm not doing this anymore. And so RNA polymerase actually can't make it that far. And RNA polymerase gets tired. And so we never actually get good transcripts from this. But when we put these together and we throw out all that intervening space, we've actually put the promoter that was by V really close to an enhancer that's at the end of this whole business. And now the enhancer is really close to the promoter. They can work together. RNA polymerase is like, yeah, I can do this. And so we finally get a transcript. Before that we cut out all of that random, all that stupid DNA that no one cares about and we aren't using, RNA polymerase was never going to actually transcribe this. And so one of the nice things about making the change to the DNA and making and doing this recombination is that we're putting our promoter and enhancer really close together. We're getting rid of all that excess DNA we didn't need. And now we can actually do transcription. It's like possible where it wasn't possible before. Um, so one other piece of this to um, think about. Um, I've mentioned to you, um, and I'm going to a little bit later today, but also very much on Friday, go into like the enzymatic details. I'm going to be like drawing se DNA sequence on the board. There's going to be like nucleophilic attacks and stuff. We're going to see some of that kind of stuff coming up on Friday. And it's really going to focus on what's going on at either V, D, and J or V and J. We're going to be kind of thinking about making those variable regions and what goes on with the DNA. For right now, I'm just going to tell you, you kind of leave the constant region alone. Um, and so you can see constant region just kind of keeps carrying down here. OK? Let's imagine that my B cell that I have over here on the board that shows V2, D3, and J2. Let's imagine that my B cell decides it doesn't like those. It doesn't like V2, D3, J2. Yes, self, yes, little voice in my brain. I am leaving something out when I say it this, but it's OK for right now. Um, can that B cell make a different choice? Can that B cell try something else? What do you think? OK, you think no. And the correct answer is no. Why not? The DNA is gone. So one of the things to remember with this, this recombination process is that when we change the DNA, there's no going back. We can't fix the DNA and like go back to the earlier thing. Once you've made that DNA change, you're living with it for the rest of your B cell life. So it, and in particular, with a heavy chain, it's pretty important because there's no other Ds. <laughs> Like, you already threw away the rest of the Ds. You literally cannot choose any other ones. Um, and so one of the kind of pieces of this is that when we think about some of the steps in this process, um, we can think about, are these steps that are happening to the DNA, or are they steps that are happening to the RNA? Because the DNA steps, once you make that DNA change, you made that DNA change for the rest of your life. But the, an RNA change, you can actually go back and play with a little bit. You can make further changes to RNAs. And so, for example, when the B cell is making the decision about whether it wants to make secreted antibody or B cell receptor, the transmembrane protein, it does that at the level of RNA, so it can do both. Because the RNA, it can just have the same old DNA, and it can just do transcription in different ways and make different RNAs. But if you, but any change that we see throughout this process that is a change at the level of the DNA, you're stuck with forever. And there's no way to further change it. Yeah, Brenna. Are there instances where the B cell won't change 
Uh, yes. There are instances where we're going to see the B cell wanting to change. We're going to see them next week. And the B cell is not going to, is, well, we'll see reasons, times when it, times when there are situations where changes happen and situations where they don't. But if the B cell wants to change and can't, like wants to, and it's a change that it is not possible to make with the DNA, the B cell dies. Because it, it's got no other, it, it's got something sucky and it can't make any change. Yeah. Where's it going to get the, the DNA to add back? Mm -hmm. um, that will, I will be able to explain that better with the molecular stuff that comes up more on Friday. Because we're going to, I'm going to have to talk about some of the molecular details of that. So um, hold that till Friday. Um, I will come back to you and ask you that exact same question after I have gone over a different part of this on Friday. Um, but what I want you to be, be sort of aware of as you're thinking about some of the, the things that are leading to these B cell receptor and antibody genes is that you want to think about are we changing the DNA or are we changing the RNA? Um, is it a thing we can go back on or not? Um, so I originally had um, my little restaurant. I had 10 recipes and I made 25 dishes, right? How the combos work. Um, and I drew some B's, D's, and J's, but I was lazy and didn't draw that many. So how does, how, what does this actually look like, numbers-wise? Um, so for, we keep, we're sort of still discovering some of this. Um, but for the heavy chain, we think there are about 45 V's, 23 D's, and 6 J's. And so if you actually multiply those together and get how many combos you can make to make how many different heavy chains, you get 6,210 heavy chains. And that's 6,210 heavy chains from... Seventy-four genes so you can see that this whole math of using combinations is buying us a lot of we get a lot of proteins for a small number of genes um, with the light chain we either have kappa or lambda so we can, for kappas we have 41 V's and 5 J's for lambdas, we've got 33 Vs and 5 Js. So we can make 205 um, kappas and 165 lambdas. Um, and so that is, what is that, 370 light chains out of less than 100 genes. So that's, yeah, that's, so that's pretty good. And then if we take all the different light chains and all the different heavy chains and try them in different pairs, we're at, we're at less than 200 genes. If we add up 45 and 41 and 33 and 23, less than 200 genes, 2 million antibodies, 2.3 times 10 to the 6 antibodies. So what I hope that you notice here is that the combinatorial diversity is a big way that we are getting lots of protein combos out of a small number of genes. Um, but there is sort of one other thing that you might notice from these numbers. 2.3 times 10 to the 6. Um, is a big number, 2 million. It's not 10 to the 16th, which was the number I was trying to get us to. So the combinatorial diversity doesn't get us all the way there. We need something else that's going to ramp this up and get us the rest of the numbers. Um, what I also haven't specifically mentioned in talking about this is that um, I haven't actually told specifically mentioned those loops, the CDRs, 
which if you remember, the CDRs were the little loops on the end of the immunoglobulin domain of the heavy chain and the light chain that are actually contacting the antigen. And so I haven't told you, mentioned those loops at all in all of this. And so you might say, what about those complementarity determining regions, those hypervariable regions, the regions that are the most variable, the little loops? You can see these are my little loops here that are the three fingers on the heavy chain. I know this is heavy chain because it has H. And the light chain, I know that's light chain because it has L. They're, that are actually making the contacts. How do they fit into all of this? Um, and for CDR, and also what you can notice if you look at this is that in both heavy chain and light chain, we look at the amount of variability. CDR3 is way more variable than the other ones. Like CDR3 is those super crazy, hyper, a lot, mostest variable region. It turns out that CDR1 and 2 are pretty lame or relatively lame. They're just encoded by whatever V segment you picked. So there's like 100 V segments, and each of them encode loops. That would be CDR1 and CDR2. But CDR3, the really, really, really variable one, is interesting here. Because CDR3 is actually encoded by the DNA right where we did the cutting and pasting, right where we did the joining. And so here, this little box is showing you CDR3. And you can see in the heavy chain, it's like encoded by the area, the end of the V, the D, and the J. This really unique area that's special to this one B cell that picked this one combo. For the light chain, the V, the, the CDR1 and CDR2 are encoded by the uh, V segment, and the CDR3 is encoded by the junction of the V and the J. So we're getting this, we have this one loop that's binding antigen that is super unique and variable, and it's actually coming from how we joined together the DNA, which is known as the junction. Yes? So it's actually for the heavy chain, it go all, goes all the way from V through D to J. So it's actually at the junction of all three of them for heavy. Um, but you're exactly right for light. Yeah, David. For the CD3, or CDR3, the heavy and the light, there's a kind of that or kind of just two It's random totally random combinations. Um, so at these sites in CDR3, I've mentioned the word that it's the junction. It's the place where we pasted together the DNA, right? We pasted together the V that we've chosen, the D that we've chosen, and the J that we've chosen, or the V and the J that we've chosen, if this is a light chain. The other way that we get diversity is that when we do that pasting, which again is when we're really thinking about the CDR3 region, we don't paste precisely. Sometimes we, so here we're trying to paste together this V sequence that's pink and this J sequence that's yellow. Since it's a V and a J with no D in between, we know it must be a light chain. And sometimes we end up with this where we like deleted some. Sometimes we can actually add some extra ones. And so our pasting at that junction or the ligation of the two pieces of DNA together, or as you can see here, the joining, is not precise. And so sometimes we get a little bit of addition or subtraction of some base pairs there. And that's how we get extra diversity here. So even if we had two B cells that chose the same V, the same D, and the same J, 
they could do their cut and paste a little differently in terms of how many base pairs they added or subtracted. And as a result, they would have different CDR3s and they would bind to slightly different antigens. Um, and so this is, that's really all junctional diversity means, is that we have this very imprecise joining of those two pieces of DNA. Um, and so when we actually can, uh, when we actually add on all of the changes in how many base pairs get added or subtracted with junctional diversity, that's how we get to our final number of antibodies. This textbook is showing you 10 to the 13 instead of 10 to the 16. It does not actually matter to us whether it's 10 to the 13 or 10 to the 16. Just know that the junctional diversity on top of the combinatorial diversity is how we get a big number. I see some puzzled looks and questions. Sounds good. So when we're pasting, uh -huh. not precisely, is mm -hmm. it because we, the cut wasn't precise? Or is it just when they pasted, they just got there? We, that is part of the mechanism detail when I'm drawing sequences and like three prime hydroxyls on one, or on Friday that I'm specifically going to address. So that is exactly coming up on Friday. Great question. Yes. Um, maybe, yeah. And you can imagine that, well, and so you, you say the flaw in precision and how this works. Um, but realize that in the organism, so if you imagine um, an organism that did not have this, that organism would make fewer antibodies, right? Yeah. And its baby might die of some infectious disease that it couldn't make an antibody to. <laughs> oh, oh no. So what what I hope that what I hope you see here and a million times throughout the semester is sometimes when I look at immunology, I look at them and I'm like, yeah, this is evolution because evolution is a mess. And if I if I was going to try to put this together myself, I would not do some of these weird things. Um, and also, you know, I've mentioned this before, but realize that, you know, the choosing of the V, D, and the J, I say choosing, that's a bad verb here. It's completely random. This is all a numbers game. Each B cell is basically getting a V, D, and a J that it uses. And you're just hoping based on the number of B cells that you make that you get one of every combo. Is that, do you have another question there? No? Okay. Um, and so this is sort of another way of thinking about um, what I just said. Um, so this process that I have just described to you of VDJ recombination, um, this is one of the most important things to know about this. This is one of those things that so many people have misconceptions about immunology with. This happens during development of your B cells. When the B cells are developing in a primary lymphoid organ like the bone marrow. You right now are making new B cells who are doing development, and you've been doing it ever since you were a fetus. And those B cells are just randomly picking a V, a D, and a J. All in the primary lymphoid organ. This is happening before you see antigen. Before you get infected. You right now have made one B cell of every possible combo already. You got one of every single one. The, the some crazy pandemic that's gonna happen in 20 years, you already have one B cell that has made that VDJ combo. You already got it right now. The reason, but the issue is you only have one of it. And one of it is not going to be enough to really protect you. The only thing that's going to really help you is if when you get a whole army of it. When it finds its antigen, this pandemic pathogen in 20 years, finds its antigen, it gets a signal. It basically gets a signal that says, you are useful. You are good. We need more of you. And it makes many copies of itself. Right now, 
I don't think any of you have ever had Ebola. I hope that none of you have ever had Ebola. Right now, you all have B cells that recognize Ebola epitopes. And what I sincerely hope for you is that those B cells go around your body to different lymph nodes for the rest of your life. And as one of my colleagues once described it, those B cells die of unrequited love when you die because they never found their antigen and they never got to make a clone of themselves and do something. So ideally, you have one of every, of every B cell making every antibody, but one isn't enough to do much for you. You need the whole clone army version of it. And that only happens after it expands in a secondary lymphoid organ after seeing antigen. So every, so, you know, we can talk about any antigen you want. You already have one B cell right now that makes that antibody. It's just waiting to maybe multiply and make more of itself. Yep, Brooke. So it only clones if it finds the antigen? And gets a signal, yeah. But does it, can it randomly find the antigen? So it's basically, it spends all of its time going around the body being like, are you my antigen? Are you my antigen? Are you my antigen? Are you? It just circulates your body for your whole life. Mm -mm. No, it just goes from secondary, from lymph node to lymph node around your body for your whole life, okay. being like, can I find my antigen in this, lymph, in this lymph node? If I do, then I know that region is where I should, like, you know, if, if go to and start doing surveillance. But it spends its whole life looking for its one antigen. Okay? okay? Mm -hmm. And, again, in many cases, you hope it never finds it. Yeah. Yes? Have you every possible B cell. I have, I have every you have, you have, yeah. You already got it. Yes. We can actually. Yeah, yeah. Every single and there's another process that we're going to talk about that happens late in the life of B cells that actually even ramps us up and makes it better. But we're not. We're we're still in the primary lymphoid organ. We're not there yet. Yes. So, so, so we, so that's a great question. Um, I say that this is adaptive because one of the things that we use when we when we are defining adaptive sometimes is ability to do VDJ recombination to make that really specific receptor where the innate receptors did not involve VDJ recombination. Okay. So I'll be your question. Okay. Um, so yeah, here you can see just another view of VDJ recombination happening in the absence of antigen. So VDJ recombination happens here to make this B cell before you ever got infected. So VDJ recombination is like here before all of the rest of this business. So whenever you're sitting around doing nothing and your mom yells at you, you can be like, I'm doing VDJ recombination. Um, it's very complicated. You need to give me some space. Um, and the specific um, details of exactly how that works in terms of molecular mechanisms are what we're going to talk about on Friday, as well as one other kind of caution or issue related to VDJ. Um, so I will see you guys in lab tomorrow. Um, yeah, that's it.